All right, well, we have a busy evening plan, so I think that we should get started. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Charlene Margo, and I am the co-founder of Nonprofit, the parent venture that brings you tonight's program, the Parent Education Series. We are delighted to have with us Dr. Avery Carter Walker, and tonight's topic is very important. What should parents know? Eating disorders rising in children and teens. Well, tonight is one in a series of special events that we have sponsored with our funders, Mills Peninsula Hospital Foundation and San Mateo County Office of Education in partnership with this organization, The Parent Venture. We are extremely, um, extremely grateful to both of these funders and it has been a wonderful series to date. Tonight's event is something that we know is really important on the minds of many parents with close to 300 registrants. Eating disorders have risen astronomically during the pandemic and Dr. Walker is gonna be here to tell us more about that. Before we get started, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. Uh, Dr. Walker will be speaking tonight in webinar format for about 30, 35 minutes. And then I will join him for some questions from you, the audience. We really do want to hear from you. So there's two ways, again, for audience members to interact with us. There's the chat button. So please do use the chat to share comments with one another or any technical issues with us but we'd like you to put your questions in the Q&A. So comments, my co-founder Bev Hartman will be putting resource links in the chat and then questions in the Q&A. We'll try to get to as many of your questions as we can. Um, if you signed up but could not attend live or would like to share this with a partner, a child, a colleague, it is being recorded and this video will be available on our video library. We partner with the team at Boys and Girls Club of the Peninsula for our videography and it is funded by Sequoia Healthcare District. So thank you both to the Boys and Girls Club and Sequoia Healthcare District. At the very end of the evening, you'll see a link in the chat for a very quick two minute survey. We hope that you will take time to fill that out as it provides information for future planning and for our funders. All right, let me tell you a little bit about tonight's featured presenter. Dr. Avery Carter Walker is a child psychology postdoctoral fellow in the Stanford Eating Disorders Program. Dr. Walker is a graduate of Chatham University, Doctorate of Psychology, Counseling Psychology Program, and he completed his postdoctoral internship in professional psychology with Iowa State University Student Counseling Services. His research interests include food as a love language, men's issues, minority and additive stress, and interpersonal conflicts and intimacy concerns. Clinically, Dr. Walker is interested in the treatment of eating disorders across the lifespan with particular interest in boys and men, LGBTQIA identities, and culture, race, ethnicity, and individual differences. Please join me in a really warm virtual welcome for tonight's speaker, Dr. Avery Walker. Take it away, Avery. Thank you so much, Charlene, for that warm introduction. I appreciate that. I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. Starting off with sharing my screen, there we go. Okay, so in our presentation tonight, um, I, well, as this is a presentation, um, I really hope that it can be more of a uh, conversation that I am speaking with you and not at you or around you. So please feel as free that if you have any questions, comments, uh, thoughts, reactions, go ahead and drop those into the question uh, to the Q&A box, and we'll be sure to get through as many of those as we can tonight. Um, I want to make sure that folks leave the space having a better understanding of how to identify um, if they have any concerns, what resources might be available to them, how to have these conversations with their children, and to ensure that um, everyone is healthy and safe when it comes to thinking about food and body. So again, uh, what should parents know? Um, eating disorders rising in uh, children and adolescents. In us getting started, I want to take us through a uh, small experiential activity. Um, as we see these pictures here uh, on the screen, I want you all to think about or imagine uh, your favorite foods and your favorite foods uh, being taken away from you. Not in the sense that you can't reach these foods right in front of you, but the idea that your mind and your body won't allow you to consume and enjoy these foods the ways that you, you once did. Just imagine.
Now, and thinking about not being able to enjoy or appreciate foods or um, you know anything for that matter that you enjoy. I, I share this to say that many of our young kids are under um, under attack, and the idea of uh, this pressure to be thin, whether that comes from uh, family, culture, um, social groups, school, or even media, we see all the time that there's this idea of the unrealistic body perception. There are countless photos of celebrities, models, Instagram, social media influencers that impact the way that our teenagers and our children uh, begin to perceive themselves. Of course, social media feeds are, are tightly curated with highlight reels, hand-selected photos showing people uh, only at their best. But our adolescents, our children and our teens, they don't know that. And oftentimes they perceive it as the reality. A quick overview of what we'll be going over tonight. Very general uh, you know, of eating disorders. We'll talk about some gender differences, but differences that uh, range from race, ethnicity, culture, um, sexual orientation, how those uh, may show up or how eating disorders may show up in the lives of, of folks with difference. We'll talk about some warning signs, some red flags, things that parents can become aware of or begin to, to if they notice what else they could do if these things are happening. The role of social media, a uh, summary of the session. We'll talk about some resources, uh, local, national, and international, uh, the Q&A and the reference section. There are a few learning objectives tonight, uh, being able to identify two or more warning signs of a possible eating disorder, uh, gain awareness to resources available to treat uh, eating disorders, and strategies to communicate concerns to medical and psychological providers. So eating disorders, what, what are they? Uh, what we know is that eating disorders affect more than 5 million people living in the United States each year. More than 90% of those afflict, afflicted are adolescents, teenagers, and children, mostly young adult women between the ages of 12 and 25. Now, uh, about one person dies every hour as a direct result of an eating disorder. Eating disorders have the highest mortality rate among all mental health and psychiatric concerns. Anorexia is the most deadly mental illness. Um, one study found that people with anorexia are 56 times more likely to commit suicide than people without an eating disorder. Up to half of those people with an eating disorder have misused some substance and are five times higher uh, rate than the general population. And the vast majority of people hospitalized for eating disorders have co-occurring co health conditions, mood disorders like major depressive disorder as primary underlying conditions, followed by anxiety um, disorders such as obsessive compulsive disorders, post-traumatic stress disorders, substance misuse disorders. Diabetes patients, who have an eating disorders struggle with controlling their diabetes, which exposes them to diabetic complications such as heart disease, stroke, uh, neuropathy, loss of vision, and kidney disease. So uh, eating disorders. We know that there's the anorexia, bulimia, binge, uh, but there are some new ones that have emerged over the last few years with the changes from the DSM-4, which is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, um, and into the DSM-5. Uh, we have things like ARFID, which is the Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder. Um, we have rumination and uh, other specified feeding or eating disorders or unspecified feeding disorders. Now, anorexia involves the self-deprivation of food due to distorted body image. Those afflicted with anorexia have harsh food and beverage restrictions that prevent them from eating healthy amounts of food. Essentially, these people are not eating enough. Uh, they're starving their brain and it impacts the rest of their body. Now, bulimia is characterized by binge eating followed by purging the contents of the meal in order to maintain the ideal body weight. Bulimics will purge the food from, um, from the body 
uh, by almost any means necessary, whether that's self-induced vomiting, the use of laxatives, excessive exercises, or other compensatory behaviors. Binge eating, which is similar to those affected by bulimia, except there's no purging. A teen struggling with binge eating disorder will feel helpless to stop the eating sessions and become depressed over the realization of what they just did. Uh, binge eaters typically use foods to escape from some other serious issue that they're being plagued by. Eating disorder is the most common among all eating disorders. And nearly 3% of adults experience binge eating disorder in their lifetime. Women and girls, 3.5%, uh, and men and boys, about 2% experience a binge eating disorder during their lifetime, making binge eating disorder three times more common than anorexia and bulimia combined. Less than 43% of people with binge eating disorder will ever receive treatment. It might shock you that a study uh, in 2019, 42% of first and third grade girls uh, said that they wanted to be thinner. 81% of 10-year-old children um, reported that they were afraid of gaining weight or getting fat. 46% um, uh, excuse me, between the ages of 9 and 11 um, are often or sometimes on a diet. And we know that diets are the gateway to, um, to eating disorders. And then 35 to 57% of adolescent girls engage in crash dieting fasting, self-induced vomiting, uh, diet pills, or laxatives. And it doesn't just go away. Uh, in a college campus survey, 91% of college-age female-identified persons admitted to controlling their weight through diet. So when we think about eating disorders, we often, uh, by stereotype, we think it's um, white women, affluent, um, but that essentially isn't the case. Uh, eating disorders um, uh, impact us all, race, ethnicity, culture, and other gender or, or um, individual differences. So anorexia is a life-threatening disorder that affects up to 5% of American and, and teenage girls, and it's not limited to just girls. Among teenagers, 10% of those suffering with anorexia are males. Uh, there's a common misconception that uh, eating disorders only affect, <clears throat> excuse me, girls and young women. However, disordered eating also affects boys and young men, and it's important to not overlook those atypical population. While statistics vary, um, it is believed that around a quarter to a third of eating disorders patients do identify as male. So what's the prevalence of eating disorder uh, pathology in boys? Approximately 25% of all cases of uh, anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa, 40% uh, of binge eating disorder are male. Um, at some point in their lives, about 0.3% of men report bulimia and 2% of men report binge eating disorders. Um, boys are at higher risk of ARFID than girls. Um, and ARFID again stands for Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder. Essentially, that is where um, that is where folks have challenges with eating that are related to uh, subtypes. The subtypes are um, sensory sensitivity, whether it is the taste, the color, the smell, the smell, the texture, uh, the taste, um, the presentation, the packaging, the freshness, the location of which the food is purchased from, uh, makes it difficult for someone to consume. Uh, the other is um, low motivation. Some people are just born with, um, with, with a biology that sets them up where they're just not interested in eating. And the other is the experience of some adverse reaction, um, whether that could be they choked while they were eating, they got sick after they had eaten, uh, they saw someone else uh, get sick, or they vomited or they have a fear of vomiting if they do eat. Uh, and we know uh, ARFID affects males uh, and boys at a higher rate than it does uh, girls and females. So the prevalence of eating related pathology in girls. Uh, eating disorders are more prevalent uh, in young women and men. 47% uh, of girls in fifth through 12th grade 
reported wanting to lose weight because of magazine pictures. 69% of girls uh, in fifth through 12th grade reported that magazine pictures influenced their ideal body weight and shape. Uh, and then 42% of first grade girls, um, or first through third grade girls, express that they want to be thinner. Now, while it, it does say that uh, women are more predisposed uh, to cultural messages around eating disorders, a study at NIDA is identifying that subclinical eating disorder behaviors um, are nearly as common in males as they are in female identified persons. And then we, when we think about other factors such as uh, race, um, when presented with a clinical study, um, in a study, um, clinicians, they found that, um, that while 44% of the um, clinicians who were responding to the case said that 44% uh, of them identified that white women uh, with the same clinical presentation had problematic eating behavior. And the same could change some of the demographics and um, they found that 41% um, identified that the Hispanic woman uh, in the case presented with problematic eating behaviors. And then when they changed it again to a female um, who identified as black, only 17% of the clinicians responding to the case uh, said that this eating behavior was uh, problematic. Uh, black teenagers um, are 50% more likely than their white teenagers to exhibit bulimic behaviors uh, such as binging and purging. However, are significantly less likely to receive help for eating disorder related, related issues. And then thinking about eating disorders in the LGBTQIA populations, um, there are some potential risk factors um, that impact uh, body weight, shape, and ideas or perceptions of oneself. Um, in one study, uh, they found that gay and bisexuals reported being significantly more likely to have fasted, vomited, or taken laxatives to diet, um, uh, diet pills to control their weight, lasting more than 30 days. Um, in another study, um, they found that 5% um, of, we're, we're, the, we're in the study, excuse me, only 5% of the male identified participants identified as gay, um, they were that gay men are 42%, 42 times more likely to engage in eating disorder behavior than their straight or heterosexual male counterparts. Um, and gay, gay men and boys, are seven times more likely to report binging and 12 times more likely to report purging than their straight or heterosexual male counterparts. So what are some of the warning signs? Right. We know that people of color um, with self-acknowledged eating disorders and aid concerns are significantly less likely than their white uh, peers and counterparts to to uh, be asked by doctors about eating disorder symptoms despite similar rates of eating disorders across uh, ethnic groups. So warning signs and red flags, what we can look for in our, um, in our teenagers. Any sudden changes in their eating habits. This is one of the easiest to miss um, if we're unaccustomed to eating meals together with our teen, but it's often the first sign um, of trouble behavior. Uh, refusal of food, um, excuses of why they're not hungry. Um, things like I'm sick, I have a sore throat, I ate a big lunch. Um, sudden loss of interest in their favorite foods, avoiding fatty or high caloric foods. Um, and sudden fixation with counting calories, micronutrients, um, really worried about um, what, are, what are the contents in the food, examining the um, the packaging really um, out when they eat foods and they, um, you know, are, are, are using uh, measuring cups, balances, all of those things. We want to be thinking about that. Um, any big increases in exercise? Teens suffering from eating disorders often feel driven to change their physical appearance. In addition to losing weight by eating less, a teen may decide to embark on a harsh or extreme fitness routine. The psychological and mental health problems. Um, now, 
bear in mind that an eating disorder is usually just a symptom of, mu of a much deeper psychological problem. Um, teens with a dis dismal self image, um, especially body image, may find great appeal in the idea of being skinny. Or for boys, they may have an, um, a drive for muscularity. Um, they may be convinced that others will like them more or think more of them or think better of them if they change their appearance in the way that your teen could constantly compare themselves to others, classmates, celebrities, or other public figures. Um, expressions of envy over so-and-so has a flat tummy or um, have you seen such and such as pecs or um, whosoever doesn't have a thigh gap. Those are for just a couple of examples of the remarks that you may hear from your teens. Um, an obsession with models or social media or lifestyle influencers, celebrities and athletes, the tendency to self-criticize, never being satisfied with the way they look, um, even though they look good. Some other tale, tale signs of eating disorders in teens are bad teeth. We know that um, from purging, uh, the stomach acids can erode the enamel from the teeth and changes can occur um, there. Wearing baggier clothes to disguise their changing bodies. Um, purging can lead to big increases in plaque and tartar. And then bloodshot eyes or, or light on the eyes from vomiting. Other warning signs can include some of these. So um, noticing that they look thinner, they're not sleeping, skipping meals, eating in isolation. Um, avoiding or withdrawing from social media um, or from social gatherings involving food, uh, obsessively reading nutrition information or counting calories, refusing to eat from certain food groups. We see this with carbs um, or um, fatty, fatty foods, butters, condiments, um, rigidity around eating and some, some perhaps rituals, going to the bathroom in the middle of meals and coming right back. Perhaps this individual is consuming food and purging it. And then of course we have the new wave of social media. So 75% of children ages six to 17 want to be an influencer. Uh, in a study published by The Sun, uh, they found that three quarters of Gen Z and millennials, so I guess I, fit into that somewhere, um, surveyed, uh, and they chose that becoming a YouTuber or social media influencer as their desired career. Uh, in the same study, they also found statistics where one in three aspire, 34.2%, to be um, a blogger or blogger, uh, and one in six uh, want to be uh, things such as like a pop star or movie star. Um, while respective of these uh, career choices, we know um, or we, we can um, infer what we see on social media and the messages or the body types that we see among um, some of these careers, bloggers, bloggers, uh, movie stars, and pop stars. All right. So this is a clip from YouTube. And I hope you can all see some of the smaller, um, some of the smaller text. But uh, if you if you could read um, some of the descriptions, um, it's what I eat in a day. And um, we're seeing that YouTube or the social media influencers are really influencing the way that our kids are eating, their thoughts and perceptions around their bodies. So there's one here, I believe, in the middle. It says, "What I eat in a day." balanced meals, tips I use for healthy eating. And in one month, this had 177,000 views. The one right above that, it says, what I eat in a day for a snatched waist, 21 pounds down. In one day, it got 37,000 views. So if we think about it, our kids have been in social distance learning or, or learning from home. Who's, who's watching these videos? Where are they getting the information from about these videos? Considering the exposure that they have to these videos. And as you see, names are covered, I'm, I'm too early into my career to consider uh, liability or litigation. So 
that's protected. But if you type their names in or you type some of these titles in, what I eat in a day on YouTube, you'll see just how vast and, and deep these, these videos run. Here we have more. In one year, this one almost got a million views. What I eat in a day to lose weight, another in three months, what I eat in a day, healthy, easy recipes. Some more, three months, 312,000. Um, the ultimate guide for being that girl. In nine months, it's got 3.6 million views. What do, our, what do our teens and our young people think is happening or how do they believe that they could, could, could be themselves while they're being influenced by the glitz and glam and, and illusions of social media? Not to mention that many of these influencers are being uh, compensated or paid by birds to put this information out. So how do parents help? Well, social media, considering the pressure many teens feel to achieve the Instagram perfection, um, it's not a surprise that 80% of girls say that they've downloaded a filter or used an app to change the way that they look at photos uh, by the time they're 13 years old. So some things that parents can do, oh, going way too fast, what happened there? Okay, learn how modeling self-confidence um, and having the selfie talk can curb negative self-perceptions of self, uh, creating a safe space of non-judgment and, and uh, free dialogue about how teams use the internet for starters. Be supportive. Um, supportive in ways that remind them that you are there to support, uh, support them and just want them to be Focus on positive personality traits and emotional health instead of exclusively on food or what physical appearance looks like. Model recovery in your own relationships with food, weight, exercise, and uh, work to create an environment in your homes that is uh, promoting health behaviors and alternatives. If your child denies they're having a problem, say simply and calmly, um, Repeat the observations you've made. Make, uh, make an argument of the evidence of the problem. Repeat your concern about their health and their well being. Uh, repeat your conviction um, that circumstances at least be evaluated by a counselor or a therapist. Uh, end the conversation if it's going nowhere or you or your kid is becoming too upset. Take any actions necessary. Um, for, for you to further, for further responsibility and leave the door open for discussion. So in summary, 95% of all dieters will regain most of their weight in five years. 35% of normal dieters progress to pathological dieting as dieting is the gateway to an eating disorder. Uh, for those uh, 25 to 30% of the normal dieters, um, they will reach some sort of partial or full um, disordered eating syndromes. Uh, the body type and portrayed uh, advertising as the ideal is possessed naturally only by 5% of females. Only 5% of women are naturally as thin as celebrities or social media influencers or models portray. Choose and use social media mindfully. Engage your teenage person uh, to choose media that supports their value, build self-esteem and body confidence. Uh, limit screen time of social networking. Uh, the more we expose our body, to, or the more we're exposed to body perfect uh, images, the more vulnerable we are to compare our appearances to the unrealistic standards. Uh, protecting your self image by monitoring the quantity and the quality of mainstream and social media at times. Uh, test some of the body positivity messages. Um, use media literacy strategies to think critically about messages you consume or that your teen is consuming um, and the content that they're creating on social media. Uh, to test for body positivity, start asking some of the questions. Um, 
are the body depictions realistic or digitally altered? What does the message really mean? What are they hoping to convey to me in this message? What are they selling me? Why is this something that I'm being exposed to? Perhaps you are in the algorithm. You have liked a photo or two too many, and now this is all that we're exposing ourselves to. How might it affect our body and the way that we accept ourselves or your team may be accepting themselves? Uh, who created it? Who profits from this message? Going back to the idea of Instagram and social media influencers, are you being compensated to tell me that this is how I should look? Um, before texting, tweeting, posting comments um, about others, ask ourselves, why are we sending this message? Who do, we, who do we want it to reach? And analyze the idea of body positivity with that. Uh, talk back to media about body uh, image. Tell people who profit on social media or media images and establish policies what you like and don't like about the body representation. Um, why you feel this way and what you, um, what you plan to do about it. Take a stand and refuse to read. You can always block them. That's the easiest thing to do, right? We know our, we know the teams love to block, right? We, they block friends, family, it doesn't matter. Block them, that's what they do these days. Uh, take a stand and refuse to read these things. Uh, you and listen to media or buy advertised products until they make, uh, they make those changes. Advocate for body positivity in, in spaces, schools, um, extracurricular activities. Um, any place that your teen or young person is hanging out, um, uh, you can make the difference there, easy. Um, some resources, um, of course, locally, there's the, uh, the Stanford Eating Disorders Outpatient Clinic, um, where we use uh, family-based treatment across eating disorders to support young people into recovery. Um, family-based treatment is the only evidence-based treatment for eating disorders, for anorexia. It is currently in um, some clinical trials, other eating disorders. But what we have seen anecdotally is that it um, uh, treatment outcomes are similar to. Um, other resources include the Academy of Eating Disorders, um, the Guide for Help, uh, ELISA Project, Body Positivity, um, EDA, um, eating Disorders Foundations, um, Eating Disorders Hopes. Um, I can certainly put these uh, in the chat once we wrap up and we begin uh, the Q&A. Um, so some books that uh, in literature that are is available, um, what every parent needs to know about eating disorders, um, help your teenager beat an eating disorder, uh, and then life without ed. And that's where we wrap up. And I wanna pass it back off to Charlene to open us up for Q&A. Well, thank you, Dr. Walker. That was so interesting. And we have lots of people saying, thank you so much for talking about this. And we really appreciate the multicultural lens that you brought to tonight's conversation. Really wonderful. All right, I'm gonna start with a heavier question and work our way forward. All right. Uh, for those of us who may not have been at the very beginning with us, could you comment on the fact that eating disorders are considered a mental illness and how suicide actually is a real problem with kids who may have an eating disorder? Absolutely. So as far as eating disorders being a real um, <laughs> mental health disorder, it, uh, it most certainly is. And the way that eating disorders oftentimes manifest themselves are very different um, and unique case by case for pers per person, right? So we know that there is criteria um, from the um, APA, the American Psychological or, or Psychiatric um, Association that says, if you're seeing these sorts of behaviors, this is an eating disorder. Now, the disturbances of an eating disorder um, or, or eating disorders become more than disordered eating when functioning is disrupted. So when we are starting to see or notice that um, the eating has impaired academic, social, vocational, 
um, interpersonal relationships, their inability to go on with their day to day, just like many other um, uh, disorders like anxiety or depression, schizophrenia, bipolar, as we are seeing the behaviors manifest and impair one's ability to function, that is when we transition from the idea of disordered eating to eating disorders. I hope that gave some clarity around uh, eating disorders as a um, mental illness or um, disorder. And then from uh, the, the, the lens um, of the other side of the question asking about um, eating disorder uh, and the rate of suicide, uh, I, we describe it as the, this idea of ED. And ED is the um, essentially breaking down eating disorders, E-D, that's ED. And these active voices of, oftentimes are what our kids or, or anyone who experiences an eating disorder is experiencing. Um, the voice um, or the, the cognitions is essentially saying to them um, that you're not good enough. You cannot eat. Um, you don't deserve to eat. Um, if you eat, you're going to be fat. Or if you eat, you're going to be unworthy. No one's going to love you. And essentially, the, it becomes overwhelming. Um, the, the young person or the uh, adult or anyone for that matter living with the eating disorder oftentimes cannot bear it. And the pain that they cannot bear because they don't have the support often results in um, an attempt uh, of suicide or a completion in death by suicide. Yeah. All right, thank you for that clarification. So, you know, um, I think many people assume that somebody who has an eating disorder has to be very thin, like the model we saw on the screen. Mm -hmm. But isn't it true that a normal weight child or even an overweight child may have an eating disorder? Absolutely. So we know that uh, binge eating disorder um, is also a, a gateway to obesity. But before we get to the idea, to the diagnosis of obesity, which is not an eating disorder at all, obesity is not an eating disorder. Um, the binge eating and the binge behavior is um, is a disorder. Um, my thought just escaped me. So uh, uh, we know that binge leads to um, to to the overweight, um, uh, and and that's how someone would reach um, classification for obesity. So obesity uh, or binge is an eating disorder, but someone can actually uh, restore their weight if they went through um, FBT or any other uh, eating disorders program and still difficulties with the psychological component where they have undue influence on body image, weight, shape, or size, or they um, their lack of recognition in how their, um, their body weight is unsafe can meet criteria for an eating disorder. So to be ultra thin or to be extremely thin is not to say that's the only way an eating disorder would manifest or what someone would look like with an eating disorder. Okay, thank you for that. So here's a parent who would like to know if we know what the causes of ARFID are, and maybe you could tell us again what that acronym stands oh, for. Oh, sure. So ARFID stands for Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder. And I, I, um, I didn't catch that. What was the first part of that question? Do we know what the causes are of ARFID? Um, no, we don't know. Um, well, I, I would suspect that some clinicians or researchers um, have hypothesized or made some, some sort of associations or, or would infer. But from the, um, from the evidence-based treatment approach to treating ARFID, um, in family-based treatment, we consider all um, eating disorders to be um, agnostic in the sense that there is no origin, there is no, um, there is no blame, there is no, uh, there's no reason for the eating disorders. It's something that just happened. Okay, thank you. That is an interesting point. Mm -hmm. So we have lots of questions that coming from parents whose kids have different situations. So let's see how we can kind of get through these, Avery. Okay. Um, here's a parent who says, our 10-year-old son has sensory deprivations that make him a very picky eater. He doesn't like tastes of things like fruit. Um, and he gets tired of foods very quickly. What can we do to help him with this issue and make sure he gets enough nutrition to mm -hmm. grow to his full potential? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This sounds like a very hard kid. 
Um, uh, I would say that oftentimes um, what we what you can do um, if 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 available, and, and I do realize that a lot of what I'm sharing is speaking from a point of privilege uh, to access. Um, so I want to be mindful of that as well. Oftentimes we um, the kids who have sensory sensitivity can work with an OT. Um, and the occupational therapist can support the family in identifying ways to help, not only help the kid eat uh, better, but can identify a range of foods um, to support the, the young person in reaching their full growth potential. Um, and some of the things that they may do is called um, uh, food chaining, food shaping, um, where you're oftentimes um, finding groups of food that your young person does like, uh, and continuing to build off of that. So an example is, um, let's say the young person really likes waffles and they make waffles. Well, what might be another food item that's closely related to waffles that you can switch in and out so that there is a decreased likelihood of when your kid burns out on waffles, um, your home isn't um, in chaos because there's nothing else for your kid to eat. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh... Here's a parent who asks, if parents suspect disordered eating, I'm wondering when you say, take any actions necessary for you to further your responsibilities, sure. what do you really mean? Sure, uh, essentially is that um, if, if, if what we are doing by you know, naming some of the observations that we're seeing in front of our young people and they are um, perhaps not interested or not responding, um, with honesty, what you can do is um, have them seen by your pediatrician um, and inform the pediatrician of the changes or the behaviors that you're noticing. Um, things that the pediatrician can, they can check for heart rate. Um, if the heart, one example is if the heart rate is low, um, we know that our kids are not eating. Um, they can also check for electrolytes. If there's an electrolyte imbalance, there's certainly, or there could be some purging going on. If you have suspected the behavior for a long time um, uh, and it's not been something that's been brought up, you can ask the dentist, what changes do you see in the, in the teeth of my, ch my child? Is there any erosion? Could there be um, any purging that, that might be occurring? So really getting your medical providers involved and really advocating for, for your young people. All right, thank you for that. So here's a good question. And I know this is a, a common occurrence. Parent asks, many of the eating disorder treatment programs in this area have long wait lists, sometimes as long as six to seven months. What can families, friends, and schools do to help a person with an eating disorder while they wait for treatment? This is especially an, um, an issue for families with limited resources. So long wait lists at treatment centers, what yes. can families, friends, and schools do? Absolutely. So one thing that I would encourage all families to do is to, when you reach out for, um, especially if you reach out to some sort of academic medical center that, uh, that's associated with um, uh, some sort of uh, eating disorders program, more than likely there are some sort of research studies that are going on, that are happening. If you uh, reach out and ask if there are any research studies for eating disorders or to treat eating disorders, more than likely you're going to find something. And those treatments are free. Your kid could get free care. Um, and you, in many ways, you're contributing back to the community on ways to better, um, better treat and provide services to children, teens, and adolescents with eating disorder. So please, please think um, as creatively as possible. I do know wait lists are um, extensive and treatment is expensive, but, or and, excuse me, um, academic medical centers and spaces, if they have eating disorders, ask about research. All right, so that would be a parent could contact, for example, the Stanford Eating Disorders Clinic and ask that question? Absolutely, you could certainly reach out. There are plenty of studies going on um, across eating, um, eating disorders and treatment could be, could be available. All right, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. All right, here's a tough one. My son refuses to eat lunch at school. He has binge eating disorder. What can I do? Mm -hmm. That is a tough one. Um, 
because we know that if our kids are not eating, uh, they're not focusing, they're not concentrating. So that has a uh, compound effect um, on, on your, your son's uh, functioning. Uh, from the lens of FBT, what we would do um, essentially is we would task our parents with refeeding our children or their children. Um, and essentially that means that at every meal, one way or uh, the young person is supervised in eating. Um, oftentimes that becomes difficult for working families that not everyone is always available. Um, but given the uh, challenges that we've overcome in the last three years, we know that uh, Zoom and FaceTime and Google Hangouts are, are, are just as effective as in-person uh, meetings. So that could be an opportunity. But I would also figure out what's the challenge in uh, the young person having lunch at school? What's happening at school that uh, they might be afraid or apprehensive to eat and engage with their peers? All right. You know, we hear a lot about healthy eating, which is often a metaphor for eat less. Kids hear that. You need to eat healthy. Do you have any better language for parents to use around how you would like your child to have healthy eating habits? That's a great question, actually. Um, I would ask, has my kid eaten enough? Kid eaten enough? You know, if you, if you think about it, parents already know how to feed their children. At one point, this was a, a, an infant that couldn't, couldn't even hold a bottle for themselves. And you knew when this kid was hungry, you knew when that kid had had enough, you knew when that child needed to be burped, napped, and all those sorts of things. So uh, it's essentially a new way of feeding your kid. Has my kid had enough? We, at, at you know, between ch childhood and teenage years, it really doesn't matter what they're eating because kids shouldn't be losing weight at all. They should be always gaining weight, but recognizing when my kid has had enough. Okay, that is really interesting advice. I've not heard it said just like that. Mm -hmm. All right, here's an here's a interesting question. Uh, parent comments, eating disorders are often a coping mechanism for kids who are dealing with underlying self-image issues and mental health challenges. What do you do when a kid sees the problem with ED but is not ready to give it up as a coping or control mm -hmm. mechanism? Mm -hmm. Well, I wouldn't say that it's the kid or the young person who doesn't want to give up the eating disorder the eating disorder doesn't want to give up. So when kids are not eating enough, we know that their brains and their body is being starved. If your brain is being starved, you don't have the capacity or the, the ability to think clearly. So what can be done is the parent stepping in again and be making sure the kid is feeding and eating, but supporting the child and not sort of colluding or accommodating the eating disorder. So it's the eating disorder that is disrupting the, the young person's ability to eat or feed themselves. And it's important to separate the two um, from the person and the disorder. Like we know that uh, anyone wakes up in the morning um, normally would say like, oh, I'm gonna have breakfast. I know some days it escapes us. Um, and no one wakes up in the morning and says, I, I, I can't eat. I, if I eat, something bad will happen to me. That's a distortion. That's the eating disorder. I see. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. That's a really interesting clarification. Um, here's a question from an educator. What can schools do to educate or raise awareness on this issue? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, what... <laughs> What uh, educators can do is have a conversation with parents, reach out, express that you have some concerns. Um, oftentimes educators are, um, are mandated reporters. Um, and uh, is, it, is this something that rises to the level of neglect for a child? Um, if you have the conversation with a parent and they no change, what do you do? 
Um, that's a that's a really tough question. I think that has a lot to do with your um, ethics and values as an educator, but um, being mindful that it is our job to uh, support and protect and make sure that our young people are are safe and healthy. Okay, thank you for that. So Avery, parent asks if eating disorders are considered mental health diseases, is medication recommended as a treatment option? And if so, is it effective? Mm -hmm. That's a really good, <laughs> that's a really good question. So oftentimes uh, medications are really uh, effective and they're helpful as long as adherence is being met. Um, and the concern is, is that um, usually in underweight individuals, um, SSRIs, um, are not effective. Um, so if someone's underweight, uh, getting them to um, ideal body weight for their height, age, and gender is really important before we begin to think about um, SSRIs or in the process of getting us there. Okay. And by SSRIs, you mean some kind of a antidepressant medication? Yes. Excuse me. I apologize. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. So so many good questions coming in. Here's one. How do you break the cycle of comfort eating, guilt, eat, guilt, especially during the pandemic when anxiety has increased for many kids? Mm -hmm. That's a good question as well. You know, I, I, I would like to say, to just be very honest, that the pandemic has impacted all of us. Every, every single one of us in one way or another, like we've all had to find one way to, or some ways to cope with it. And when we're thinking about the idea of um, eating and then guilt, and then eating more to um, assage or, or diminish the sensations of the guilt, that's actually a binge. And when we, a way to disrupt a binge is to, um, to develop and build some mindfulness in there, to, to recognize, um, uh, are you purchasing or buying particular food items? Are you um, eating food in specific spaces in your home um, to binge off of whatever it is that you're binging off of? Um, what might have triggered you? Uh, where do you recognize or see yourself going um, when you know a binge is about to occur? And then disrupting that with a, um, a behavior that shifts to more pleasurable thinking, whether that's having a I don't know, aromatherapy shower or going for a walk, um, gardening, hiking, whatever you can do to shift your thinking to more pleasurable um, or support your person in shifting thinking to more pleasurable experiences. All right, thank you. So you mentioned earlier in your presentation that it can be very helpful to make observations without judgment to your Absolutely. kids. This parent asks, can you give us a script or how to bring up your observations to your child without shutting them down. So like, is there a sentence that you would suggest? Sure. Um, and is this for, what type of, is it? I think that this is probably a parent Just that a general worries. observation? Yeah, like, like maybe you've noticed that your child is over-exercising. Mm -hmm. Would you just, would you say, I've noticed that, or what would be a good intro? Oh, sure. Um, hey, I noticed that you're spending a lot of time exercising. Um, what, what, what's motivating you? Um, figuring out what's the, uh, well, the motivation under that, or um, let's say that they're not with the family anymore. Hey, I noticed that you eat in your rooms now, and uh, I just want to check in. It, did something happen that you don't feel safe or comfortable? Um, eating with the family anymore. Um, it, it, it could also be helpful to, um, as as the parent, to hold um, to hold. Uh, what's the the term is escaping me? You could even hold the blame, right? There, and there's no blame to be held, right? Make it up. Hey, um, I was wondering if I if something happened between us that you're not eating with us anymore. I'm wondering if you know because you're spending so much time in the gym. If there's something that I really opening up a space for your young person to, to really uh, share more. 
Yeah, that language around I wonder can be very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. Mm -hmm. All right, again, so many good questions coming in, Avery. I know you're doing your best to answer them all. Here we go. This is an important question. What is the likelihood of recovery without intervention? My teen is refusing therapy. What can we do to support? Well, it's not your teen that's refusing therapy. It's the eating disorder. Okay. Okay. So can one talk or behave your way out of an eating disorder? Or typically, do you need some kind of intervention? Um, so I... I I think I've heard anecdotally tales of people who just wake up one morning and decide I'm going to eat normally. I'm going to um, enjoy, you know, the foods that I previously or once enjoyed. And uh, professionally, I would not bank on the idea that it will just vanish or um, the idea that it's a phase because it certainly is not. Okay. So kind of in that vein, what would you say, parent asks, how would you address a child who's sneaking food and eating in secret? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's it, find a way that is uh, safe and warm, but with uh, empathy, compassion, and firmness um, that you are aware of this behavior. Hey, buddy, I noticed that uh, um, while cleaning your room, I found some food wrappers. And uh, I need to know what's going on or help me understand, or I'm curious. Um, mm -hmm. Some of that language, very uh, non-defensive, but, but firm and compassionate. I love that. Help me understand, being curious, wondering, really mm -hmm. great, great advice. We would mm -hmm. definitely concur with that. Mm -hmm. So again, I think we've got time for another question or two. Here's a good one. What is the best way to handle dinner time for any meal or any meal with a teenager with an eating disorder? I don't want to make it a struggle or put pressure on her, but we do want to make sure she eats something. Mm -hmm. but how do you mm -hmm. handle a meal time with a kid who has an eating disorder? Sure. So uh, I'll give you a, a real life example. If that were FBT, um, we would think about ways to convince a person to eat. And, not, and we would not accommodate or collude with the eating disorder. So uh, I suspect that your young person has a cell phone or access to the internet or something that they enjoy having. Um, using a lot of if-thens, if you eat, then you can have your phone back. If you eat, then you can have the car for the weekend. If you eat this meal, then you can, uh, have your allowance. If thens are really helpful and effective in working with teenagers who are not eating. Because we don't want to incentivize, um, we, we want to create incentives for the young person and the behavior. We don't want to incentivize uh, the eating. Oh, I see. Okay. okay. And I'm assuming that that kind of advice would be once you are working with a professional to help walk you through that process? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, a certain, and um, in some of the literature that I shared specifically, help your teen beat a uh, beat, beat an eating disorder, a lot of those um, examples are within, within the text. Uh, if, uh, if then statements, um, direct prompting, um, all, of, all of this information is available to, okay. to parents. All right. Well, thank you. We have about another minute, Dr. Walker. Is there some final summary comments you want to leave us with? It's clear that we have lots of parents online with us who are struggling with this issue. So any kind of final remarks? Sure. And again, parents, this video will be recorded and available on our video sure. library. Sure. Well, I would I would just like to say thank you all so much for taking the time to, um, to attend. And uh, early intervention is the best response for treating an eating disorder. We know that uh, eating disorders that are identified within the first two to three years, the likeliness of the uh, disorder going into full remission in this young uh, not living with any um, distorted thoughts around food body image are more likely than if treatment is not sought or um, implemented into the young person's life. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Yes, okay. Avery Carter-Walker, for all the information. I mean, this has just been a very rich hour. 
We thank you all you parents and caregivers and counselors and educators who've been online with us tonight. Appreciate you being here and supporting the conversation. So again, big thank you to you, Dr. Walker. Take care, everybody. If you have any more questions, please do reach out to us. And the link to this video when it's processed will be available and sent out to you. So take care, everybody. Stay well. And we hope to see you at the next Parent Education Series event. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Take care.